Welcome on Let's Ask a Theologian. Uh, it is a gospel-centered program where we ask and interview evangelical scholars and theologians for the equipping of the church. I am your co-host, Joshua Olivares, with Jonathan Olivares. And our topic today is going to be very, very interesting. A topic that deals with the doctrine of the millennium. A topic that also deals with eschatology and the reign of the Lord Jesus Christ. Some of us may be asking the question, is the Lord Jesus Christ reigning today? If so, what does that have to do with the millennium? Well, our guest today is a very special guest. A guest that is more than capable of answering our questions. And just to give us a little background of our theologian for today, from his website, this is what it says. He is an amillennial, Calvinistic, charismatic, credo-baptistic, complementarian, Christian hedonist, who received his Master of Theology in Historical Theology at Dallas Theological Seminary and received his PhD from the University of Texas at Dallas in 1984. He is also the author of several books, such as Understanding the Gifts of the Spirit and Kingdom Come, an Amillennial Alternative. He has served as lead pastor and is now a pastor emeritus at Bridgeway Church in Oklahoma City, Oklahoma, and is a serving member of the Council of the Gospel Coalition. And so, without further ado, we'd like to welcome our very special guest, Dr. Sam Storms. Dr. Storms, it is an honor and privilege to have you here with us today. It's good to be with you. Just one thing, mm. let's make it Sam, let's drop the doctor. Okay, <laughs> Brother Sam. Sam it is, Brother Sam it right. is. Praise God. So yeah, um, Sam, if you can kindly uh, inform our viewers, could you kindly share with us how you came to know the Lord, uh, the family life, conversion life, and uh, any upcoming projects or writings that are in the works? Sure. Well, I was raised in a Christian home. Both my mother and father were believers. Uh, I made a public profession of, of faith in, when I was nine years old. I raised a Southern Baptist really until I got to Dallas Theological Seminary, at which time I um, I began to um, engage in and minister in non-denominational churches. Hmm. So um, been married for 51 years, Wow. Um, have uh, two daughters, four grandchildren, and um, I've just finished um, a 14-year uh, span of time here at Bridgeway Church in Oklahoma City, a senior pastor, stepped down last August, and now I'm uh, working full-time with Enjoying God Ministries, writing, doing podcasts such as this. Um, I just um, just had a book accepted with Crossway on the steadfast love of God. Mm. Uh, I just concluded writing a book on worship called Feasting on God, A Practical Theology of Worship. It'll probably be out in, I don't know, a year and 18 months. So yeah, I'm enjoying that. I travel a good bit, speak, um, and uh, have a regular blog at samstorms.org. So uh, it keeps me busy, keeps me busy, mm -hmm. and I enjoy it. Well, praise God. That's fantastic. And I, we, we do have a question because uh, me and my brother has not yet uh, been married to our wives for 50 years. So any tips <laughs> or godly <laughs> advice to keep that thing rolling? Uh Probably uh, the best advice I can give you is in virtually all instances, your wife is right and you're wrong. <laughs> <laughs> That's probably about the best philosophy to keep yep. the peace in the home and to uh, have a long and uh, fruitful marriage. Amen. Praise God. Praise God for that. We learned that very quick. <laughs> <laughs> Praise God. So um, before we jump into our topic, uh, Sam, I guess uh, the question I'd like to first ask is because this is um along the lines of eschatology and it is a sure. part of eschatology could you kindly unpack for us the meaning of what does eschatology mean and why is this important for the church to understand and to even invest in sure well the greek word eschatos simply means end or conclusion so eschatology is the study of the end times or the conclusion to god's purposes in history um, of course, eschatology spans the entirety of biblical revelation because everything, as you know, is building up toward 
uh, the return of Christ and the consummation of his kingdom. So that's really what the, uh, what the issue is. Obviously, when you think of it in those terms, you can see the importance that it has for the church because um, it informs how we live. I mean, most, most statements in scripture about, that are eschatological in nature that talk about the coming of Christ are couched in ethical terms. In other mm. words, because Jesus is coming back, here is how you should live. Because Christ is now reigning and will one day consummate his kingdom, here's what you should do. Here's what you should focus on. Here's what you should avoid. So most eschatology has a very strong ethical orientation to it. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, at the end of 2 Peter 3, he said, in the light of these things, here's how you should conduct yourselves in all righteousness. Um, You know, Peter says in 1 Peter 3, the end of all things is at hand, therefore, be devoted to prayer and self-control and hospitality. So, um, and of course, really just the, the, you know, the most basic, I think, practical implication of eschatology, and I think virtually all Christians would recognize this, is the heightened hope that we have that Jesus could return at any time mm. and how that, uh, how that affects the way we treat one another, how we relate to our spouse and our children and how we conduct ministry in the local church. Um, and again, quite honestly, how we view uh, what our response should be to the, all the social, cultural, political developments in our world. Um, you know, I could easily say that if I didn't believe that Jesus was going to return and put all things to rights and consummate his kingdom, I would be living in utter despair. Yeah. Uh, the, 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 as you know, the moral and social fabric of our world is coming unraveled, mm-hmm. and it, it, it looks rather dismal at times. And what keeps me going is the knowledge that God is still in control, that he is directing history toward its consummation in Jesus, and mm-hmm. that's my blessed hope, as Paul says in Titus chapter 2. Oh, wow. Praise God. Thank you for that, Dr. Storms, or Sam, I'm sorry. And uh, I guess... Another thing I would like to follow up on is the reason why we ask that question. A a lot of our Christian brothers and sisters universally sometimes have this idea where, you know what, let's just love Jesus. Let's forget about eschatology. No one really understands uh, who is right and who is wrong. We can never really understand what is the right view. And um, what do you have to say concerning about those type of uh, points of view? Well, (laughs) In one sense, I understand what's behind that and would agree with it. Um, here's, here's the point I make with people who ask me questions about this issue. Mm. Um, we will never come to consensus or full agreement, all Christians, on mm. uh, all of the peripheral elements of, about uh, the end times, about whether there will be a tribulation, and if so, how long, and what is mm. the relationship of the rapture to it and the millennium, which we'll talk about, I'm sure, in a moment. Uh, Antichrist, uh, all these issues, the role of Israel, the relationship between Israel and the church, these are all issues on which there is, as you know, considerable disagreement and division. Mm-hmm. But here's the thing that unites us. As long as we believe that Jesus is coming back, we believe in the personal, visible, physical return of Christ to consummate his kingdom and to establish the rule of Christ in a visible and tangible way for all eternity. If we can agree on that, if we can unite around that central truth, the, um, the other elements are really secondary. And, mm-hmm. um, you know, for example, at my church uh, where, that I formerly pastored at Bridgeway, our statement of faith uh, has one paragraph, one statement about um, eschatology. And we basically simply say, uh, the one thing that unites us is belief in the second coming of Christ. Timing of it, how it relates to other factors. Uh, we don't want to divide over that. You can hold a wide variety of views as long as you stand united on our expectation of the blessed hope of the return of Jesus. So in that sense, I understand what those people you just mentioned are saying. Why do we divide, get angry, write critical articles and blog posts? Um, you know, calling people to task because they have a different perspective on some of those issues from the one we embrace. Uh, I understand that. Now, on the other hand, we ought to be committed to, to being as accurate in our understanding and our proclamation of the biblical truth as we can. Mm-hmm. 
-hmm. It matters Mm -hmm. uh, what you believe about the millennium. It matters what you believe about the timing of the rapture. It matters what you believe about the relationship between Israel and the church. I'm not saying those are unimportant. I'm just saying they are secondary and they shouldn't be a dividing point among Christians. Christians are those who are united in their expectation of the return of Jesus. You know, we have in our church people of all varieties of millennial views, differing perspectives, some dispensational, some covenant theology, some neither, uh, some some combination of both. Um, mm-hmm. And we get along fine. Uh, it doesn't mean that we don't have lively discussions. Right. I, I wouldn't necessarily want to say arguments, but we have lively <laughs> discussions. But at the end of the day, it is our common expectation of the return of Jesus that unites us. Very good. Very good. Thank you for that. Now, you, you, you mentioned the word millennium, uh, Sam. Mm-hmm. And uh, before we head uh, towards the meat of our discussion, for someone who may not be aware of these terms, millennium, millennial, or sure. millennial reign, um, could you kind of unpack for us uh, what is the doctrine of the millennium according to the Bible? Sure. Well, <laughs> yeah, it depends on who you're asking, right? Well, you're asking me, <laughs> so I'll give you my take on that issue. Um, the word is based on Revelation chapter 20, mm. where John talks about um, the rule of the saints with Christ for a thousand years. Now, that's the only place in the entire Bible where the number 1,000 is used. But um, it is basically, I think uh, it comes from a Latin word which refers to 1,000. And the issue is basically what is the millennial reign of Christ? All all Bible-believing Christians affirm the millennial reign of Christ, mm-hmm. but they differ as to its nature and its time. So, for example, those who fall into the premillennial camp, and the reason it's called premillennial, and again, I'll just define these terms for people who may not be familiar with them. Sure. It's premillennial is a way of saying that Christ will return before the millennium. That's the mm-hmm. significance of the prefix pre. And the millennium, in their view, is a literal 1,000 years of continuous human history following the coming of Christ. So um, there are dispensational premillennialists. There are what we call historical premillennialists. But they all agree that Christ returns and inaugurates an additional 1,000 years on the present earth in its unredeemed character, uh, at the end of which... God will consummate his kingdom and will launch what we call the new heavens and the new earth. All millennialists, such as myself, and let me let me clarify, that's a, I don't like the, the word. Yeah. <laughs> because, you know, when you put an alpha privative in front of a word, it means you're negating it. Like, mm-hmm. well, you're amoral or you're apolitical. Um, and I, I believe very much in the millennial reign of Christ. It's a question of when, where, and of what nature is it? Mm, right. Though so some call my view realized millennialism. Well, that's never going to catch on. A millennial <laughs> is here to stay, so let's just deal with it. <laughs> Basically, what I believe is that the millennial reign referred to in Revelation 20 is describing what is happening right now in what we call the intermediate state. Mm-hmm. Again, that's another term that needs definition. It's called the intermediate state because it's the experience of Christians in heaven who have died and are now with Christ between the time of his first coming and the time of his second coming. It's intermediate. It's in between. So I think the millennium spans the entire present church age from the time that Christ was exalted to the right hand of the Father to the time that he returns in the clouds of heaven to consummate his purposes. And it's the experience of believers who have died and gone to be with Christ. So I could say, for example, that um, St. Augustine and uh, uh, Martin Luther and Calvin, the other reformers, and um, J.I. Packer and um, Tim Keller, who just recently passed away, my mother and dad, all believers are sharing with Christ right now his rule over the nations. Uh, They are co-regents, as it were. Mm. And that's the rule and reign that is being described in Revelation 20. Uh, Now, some people push back and say, well, what about the number 1,000? Well, every place, every single time the number 1,000 is used in the Bible, it's always figurative for the perfect period of time. You remember the psalm where where God says, the cattle on a thousand hills are mine. Mm -hmm. I say, well, does that mean the 1,001 hill, God doesn't own those cattle? 
<laughs> of course he does. It's it, it's so again, I don't believe it's a literal 1000 years that you can mark on a calendar. It's been now almost what over 2000 years. Who yep. knows how much longer it will go. So I do believe in the millennium. I just believe it's happening now in heaven as Christ rules over the nations, progressively bringing all his enemies under his feet. Um, that's the amillennial view. So I believe that when Christ returns, we immediately enter into the eternal state. The new heavens and the new earth um, are inaugurated at the time of the second coming. So there's no additional 1,000 year period following Christ's return. The post-millennial view and the all-millennial view are really very similar. The post-millennialists would agree with pretty much everything I've said about all-millennialism with this one caveat. They would say that throughout the course of this present church age, the kingdom of Christ through the power of the Holy Spirit as the gospel is preached will progressively Christianize the world. Mm -hmm. doesn't necessarily mean that everybody will be saved, but that when Christ returns at the end of history, he will return to a largely Christianized world. Most people will have come to faith. Uh, the structures of society and government uh, will have been transformed according to Christian principles. In other words, they are very optimistic about the prospects for the expansion of Christ's kingdom on this earth prior to the second coming. So uh, my post-millennial friends call me a pessimistic post-millennialist. Mm -hmm. I call them optimistic amillennialists. <laughs> um, but both amill and postmill agree that there will not be a literal 1,000 year continuation of human history subsequent to the second coming of Christ. So you asked for a simple definition. I just gave you a lecture. So. <laughs> no, praise God. That's definitely going to help our viewers, uh, Sam. And before I pass it to my brother, I guess just uh, something, I, there's a key word that you mentioned, there are key terms, uh, dispensational premillennialism. Mm -hmm. And uh, having read uh, your bio, you came from Dallas Theological Seminary, yes. and the position that you're taking is the amillennial perspective. And uh, yeah, kindly share with us. You have a lot of explaining to do. <laughs> How did that happen? <laughs> yeah, it's a very interesting story. I tell a little bit of the uh, of the story in my book. Yeah. Uh, I was raised in um, a decidedly dispensate. Oops, did I lose you? No, no, we're here. Oh, there you are. Okay. I was raised in a decidedly dispensational uh, mindset. Dallas Seminary is very dispensational. Basically what that word means, without going into too much technical detail, it refers to a view that, that maintains a strict distinction between Israel and the church. God has two peoples with two separate covenants. They will inherit two different sets of promises. Mm. Progressive dispensationalists tend to kind of uh, merge and overlap them a bit more, but basically that's what dispensationalism believes. They believe that uh, the rapture, Christ will return in the heavens, take all the living believers to himself, and that will inaugurate a seven-year tribulation period, followed by the second coming and this earthly millennium. When I went to Dallas, I believed all of that until I took a course in the exegesis of the book of Ephesians. And we were at random, I think it was providential, but at random, we were assigned a paragraph to write our term paper on. And I was given Ephesians 2, 11 to the end of the chapter, in which Paul talks about how Gentiles had been formerly excluded from the promises. They had no part in the commonwealth of Israel, mm -hmm. but through the sacrifice of Christ, they've now been brought near and they have now become one new man with Israel, mm -hmm. co-heirs of yes. the same promise. So this distinction between Israel and the church, as if they have two different destinies awaiting them, I just couldn't see in light of that passage. Of course, many other texts as well. So by the time I graduated from Dallas, um, pretty soon there after my the end of my four years there, I had pretty much rejected the dispensational reading of Scripture. Um, and so, yeah, this, that's what dispensational pre-tribulational, pre-millennialism is all about. It's probably the majority view among professing evangelicals. Mm -hmm. um, it's certainly the majority view. In, it's the Assemblies of God denomination has it in their statement of faith. Um, most Southern Baptists would probably still affirm some version of that. Um, so again, most, 
I think most so-called Bible churches that are independent, non-denominational would be dispensational. Um, I think there is, uh, by the way, real quickly, I just finished reading this book that just came out called The Rise and Fall of Dispensationalism, mm. subtitled How the Evangelical Battle Over the End Times Shaped a Nation. Mm, it's, a, okay. it's a very substantive book, uh, 370 pages, and it traces the origins, the development, and what he calls uh, the fall of dispensationalism. But he also points out how it really has shaped uh, the evangelical mindset. Right. Um, so it, it's a very interesting book. It's written by a man named Daniel Hummel. So he's, he's got a free advertisement from me. <laughs> <laughs> thank you for that, Sam. Well, yeah, no, thank you for that. Um, yeah, w- with discussion with amillennialism, I mean, it's it's amazing how the Lord providentially leads us. Uh, I mean, we similar, uh, we have similar um I guess a similar trail. We came from uh, dispensationalism to historic pre-mill and then found our way to amillennialism. Um, so I guess uh, to help our audience here understand uh, where in scripture we, uh, or, or how we interpret scripture and 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 then get the result of believing in amillennialism, um, passages like Matthew 24 and 25, um, how should one read Matthew 24 and 25 uh, would you say it's more of a hermeneutic uh, issue? Um, um, how do all millennials look at 24 and 25 of the Gospel of Matthew? Sure. I'm just going to open up to it since we're talking about it. Um, let me let me say one other thing, and I want people to make sure they understand this about all millennialism. Sure. Um, many who push back against the view that I embrace say that we are spiritualizing the land promises of the old covenant. Right. And that's not true. I believe that all the promises that God made to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob concerning his rule over his people in mm-hmm. the land will come to literal fulfillment on the land, on soil, on dirt and grass, as yep. it were. But it's the land of the new earth, the redeemed and transformed earth, not this present earth that is under the curse of of Adam. Mm -hmm. So um, I do believe that there will be an earthly rule of Christ with his people. It'll just be on the new earth and not, and for eternity and not just on this old earth for only 1000 years. So I do believe very strongly in that. And I think most amillennialists are coming to realize uh, the reality of that truth. Um, As far as, um, let me, let me back up a little bit as well. People may be wondering, how did I become an amillennialist? Well, it wasn't just Ephesians 2. Toward the end of my time at Dallas Seminary, so this would have been in the late 1970s, I decided to read through the New Testament and take note of everything that happens when Christ returns. Mm-hmm. What, it, what, are the, what are the many events that are very explicitly stated in the New Testament that will occur when, when Jesus comes back? Things like um, physical death will be forever swallowed up in victory and eliminated. Um, The bodily resurrection of both believers and non-believers will occur. The final judgment of both unbelievers and believers. Unbelievers will be cast into hell. Believers will enter into eternal life in the presence of Christ. Um, The curse on the natural creation Mm -hmm. of the earth as we know it will end and uh, no longer will it be subject to all of the devastation, the environmental tragedies that we see so often today. Um, all opportunity for coming to faith in Jesus will have come to a conclusion. Mm-hmm. There will be no hope for salvation after the second coming. Um, so all of these things, it seemed to me very clearly, are affirmed in conjunction with the second coming. Mm-hmm. And yet, all versions of premillennialism deny every one of those mm. because they believe that physical death will still occur in this 1,000 year period following mm-hmm. Christ's return. They believe that the bodily resurrection will happen for a thousand years after the return of Christ. The judgment will happen till a thousand years after the judgment of Christ. People can still come to faith during the time of the millennium. Um, all sorts of uh, the, the, uh, the, the curse on the natural creation will continue for a thousand years beyond the coming of Christ. And I looked at this and I said, no, wait a minute. How can I 
acknowledge the things that happen when Jesus returns, returns, right. and yet believe in the perpetuation of a period of time in which those things still occur. Exactly. That's what led me to be, becoming an amillennialist. I said, there's simply no way in my mind that I can reconcile what the New Testament says will happen at the second coming with what premillennialism says will happen during this thousand year period. So just wanted to throw that in there. Mm-hmm. Um, I believe, uh, I read Matthew 24 and 25 in a very straightforward way. In fact, I think I read it more straightforwardly than do dispensationalists. Mm -hmm. Um, because I, you know, I read, um, the the statement, for example, in, um, verse 34, Jesus said, truly, I say to you, this generation will Mm -hmm. not pass away until all these things take place. Right. And everywhere in the gospels where the words, this generation appears, Jesus is talking about his contemporaries, Mm -hmm. the people alive at the same time that he is alive on the earth. And so it seems to me this indicates that what Jesus is describing here is primarily about what will transpire in the first century from the time of his resurrection and exaltation up until the time of the destruction of Jerusalem and the temple in AD 70. Mm -hmm. Um, Now, I know that dispensationalists, they all read. Matthew 24 is entirely futuristic. They they think it's talking about what's going to happen at the end of history and during the tribulation. I think that the tribulation that Jesus is talking about here has already come and gone. Mm -hmm. I think it was talking about the devastation on Jerusalem, basically from about 66 AD to 70 AD. Mm -hmm. Now, I want to be real clear. Having said that, I believe the entire present church age in which we live is a time of great tribulation. Um, there is, you know, when we talk about, uh, and this, this gets my blood boiling a little right, bit. Yeah. <laughs> when I hear Western Christians talk about how they want to be uh, delivered, they want Christ to come back and get them out of the world before they have to undergo tribulation. Right. And I say to them, are you aware of what's happening to our brothers and sisters in North Korea? Exactly. Are you aware of what's happening to many in Russia and in the Sudan and in other parts and in Iran and other parts of the world? There is no greater tribulation that could occur. They're being arrested, tortured. All their property is being confiscated. Their families are being destroyed. They're being thrown in prison. Many are being executed. Mm-hmm. The church of Jesus Christ has been undergoing tribulation for 2000 years and will continue to do so until Christ returns. Now, Will there be an ever-increasing intensity of tribulation as we come closer to the return of Jesus? Probably so. In other words, as bad as it is now, it's probably going to get worse. Mm -hmm. But I think it's very offensive and disrespectful to our brothers and sisters in Christ around the world who are enduring massive persecution to suggest, oh, we over here in the Western world, we're just waiting to escape all of this. We want to get out of here. Mm-hmm. I just, that, to me, that's so highly offensive to these brothers and sisters who have endured and are enduring so much. So I do think there's a possibility, and I'm still kind of on the fence on this point. I think there's a possibility that what happened from 33 to 70 AD, everything that Jesus describes, um, you know, false messiahs, uh, nation rising against nation, famines, earthquakes, uh, increasing persecution. That that occurs all through the present church age. So mm. maybe what's being described here, although it primarily refers to 33 to 70, is something of a what I call a template or a paradigm for what will occur throughout human history leading up to the coming of Christ. Right. But I do think the primary point of reference in Matthew 24 is to what transpired among the contemporaries of Jesus leading up to the destruction of Jerusalem in AD 70. Mm-hmm. Mm. Very good. So it's not uh, to be taken as a whole uh, futuristically uh, as the dispensational pre-mill and millennials do, uh, but uh, that there is a, in part, or uh, if anything, as a whole uh, before or before or entirely uh, at AD 70. And so, uh, with that being said, uh, what about uh, the book of Revelation, uh, mm-hmm. which is uh, that uh, monstrous book that everyone has a, <laughs> an issue with? 
And so just as you said, um, as people always look, and again, it's more of a Western mindset, uh, and even the countries that have been influenced by the Western mindset, uh, because that we experience less of a persecution here and, and whatnot. Mm-hmm. Um, so as many look at Revelation, they also look at it in totally futuristically and also very literal, right? Um, and so uh, the argument is, is that why when we read the Gospels to the epistles of the apostles, why should we read them differently than the book of Revelation in itself, where uh, all millennials are usually accused of spiritualizing everything and um, not taking it literal uh, or uh, verse by verse as everyone should. Yeah. yeah, obviously, Revelation, as you've indicated, it's a massively controversial book with a, a variety of differing views. Um, I do not think that anyone, if you press them, could consistently interpret a book of Revelation literally. It is filled <laughs> from beginning to end with symbols and figurative language and monsters and demons that are described in in a variety of rather grotesque forms Mm -hmm. Um, i mean it talks about a lamb being slaughtered and yet standing well that's not literal that's symbolic of the crucifixion of jesus Um, i think virtually every number in the book of revelation um, you know three four referring to the four corners of the earth seven twelve 144,000. all these numbers are symbolic Mm -hmm. Now, that doesn't mean that we're spiritualizing them because they're symbolic of something that is very real. Right. That sometimes is very literally true. Mm-hmm. So um, I, I, I just don't think it's possible that anybody can consistently say they interpret the book of Revelation literally. It was not meant to be interpreted literally. Mm-hmm. It's a highly figurative, symbolic book. It's a unique genre all to itself. And I think we have to be sensitive to that reality. Right. So, for example, if I go into a, a local bookstore, a Barnes and Noble here in Oklahoma City, you know, there are a variety of sections. There's biography, there's history, there's teen novels, um, there's psychology and self-help, there's nonfiction, there's fiction. All of those books are written um, with everybody understanding that they have to be interpreted according to the nature of the literature. Yep. Same thing with the book of Revelation. You don't read Revelation like you read Romans. Now, it's just as true as Romans, Mm -hmm. but the way in which truth is communicated is different based on the genre or the nature of the literature. I happen to believe that Revelation does speak about the end times. I think it talks about the what I call the commonplaces or the ordinary events that will transpire from the first coming of Christ to the second coming of Christ. Mm -hmm. In fact, I think you can see in Revelation an ever-increasing intensity um, as we come closer and closer to the return of the Lord. So when I read it, um, I read it, and here's a big word, recapitulation. Yeah, mm. yeah. We describe, explain, people say, what? <laughs> uh, recapitulation. It simply means this, that John begins with the first coming of Christ in the first century, and he describes the course of history up to the second coming. And then, in, and then he turns right back around. He goes back to the first century and from a slightly different point of view, describes the same events leading up to the second coming. And then he circles back around and does it yet again. He does this about seven times in the book. Mm-hmm. It's, he recapitulates over and over again from a slightly different point of view, the same course of events that occur throughout history. But all of those events all of those seven parallel accounts lead up to the end times and the return of Christ, the defeat of Satan, the defeat of the beast, uh, the victory of God's people, the final resurrection, the final judgment. Mm-hmm. So that's how I understand Revelation. The idea that um, that it's a strictly linear and purely chronological portrayal of what will happen only in the last seven years of human history, I think really misses the point of the right. book. Mm-hmm. Um, so. Yeah, it's a complex book, um, but um, by the way, if people want to dig deeper into this, uh, I preach through Revelation, and I think about 50 sermons, and all of my sermons are fully manuscripted. All of the the material is available um, at my website, samstorms.org. They can just go to resources, click on sermons, and they'll find the sermon series called Triumph of the Lamb, 
And um, I, I basically provide a full word for word commentary on the entire book there. Mm-hmm. Very good. Yeah. Uh, sorry. Go ahead. Oh, yeah. So, um, in in regards to what you mentioned earlier, Sam, you, you mentioned um, it's it's very symbolic. You mentioned the hundred forty four thousand Jews, and uh, me and my brother grew up on Finn's Dake. We grew up on his dispensational uh, mm-hmm. theology. So we we've come to to realize at least and and embrace during that time that the 144,000 Jews because it does say 12,000 from each tribe etc cetera, etc cetera. um but from an all millennial perspective how do we interpret that 144,000 Jews because we do get a lot of questions concerning about that uh during our bible study so uh, what would you say uh, from an all millennial perspective yeah i have a a couple of uh lengthy expositions of this in in my series on Revelation. One thing to remember is that the list of the 12 tribes there is nowhere found anywhere else in the Bible, nowhere in the New Testament or the Old Testament. There are various reasons why the lists differ, but that in itself should cause us to say, well, wait just a minute. Maybe this isn't meant to be taken as a reference to literal national Israel. And then given the fact that you think about the number, um, 144,000, uh, 12,000 from each of the tribes. Um, it seems to me that what is being described here, and I think the number 12 is consistently pointing to this in Revelation, both the 12 tribes of Israel and the 12 apostles, you know, their names are written on the foundation stones of the New Jerusalem. Um, so I think that this is a very vivid but symbolic way of portraying the totality of God's redeemed people, Mm -hmm. uh, both believing Israelites and believing Gentiles who are together one new man in Christ. And that's why I think immediately after the listing of the 144,000, beginning in verse 9 of chapter 7, he talks about a great multitude that no one could number. I think it's the same group of individuals looked at from a different perspective. Mm -hmm. I think the 144,000 are looked at from the point of view of earth, the great multitude is looked at from the point of view of their experience in heaven in the presence of the Lamb. So, yeah, the idea that somehow, so I would say to people who want to take 144,000 as literal, I say, well, gosh, what about the 144,000 and one? Right. Is he or she excluded from the kingdom and <laughs> right. not safe because they didn't make the 144,000? Mm-hmm. Uh, I mean, that's a very small number. And I think that's why John says, look, this, in fact, is in fact a great multitude, an innumerable body of those who have come to faith in Jesus, both Jew and Gentile. Very good. Yeah, and thank you. Um, with regards to um, you use the term recapitulation, or in your book, uh, progressive parallelism. Um, yeah. Someone approaching the Book of Revelation, do you uh, do you think that it's very important for one to have a full grasp or a clear understanding of the Gospels? Um, when interpreting the book of Revelation? Well, sure. Absolutely, I do. Um, now, do you have anything particularly in mind in the Gospels that you're thinking of? I guess uh, mainly the questions of, uh, that people would ask is that, did the Lord Jesus Christ indicate a present reign? Um, as, as again, oh. the, pre, you know, the premillennials are looking futuristically, but has the Lord ever mentioned a kingdom now? Um and that he would reign after his ministry? and Well, certainly, um, I mean, all through the four Gospels, mm-hmm. uh, it, it primarily focuses on his proclamation of the kingdom of God. The kingdom right. of God is, is at hand. Mm-hmm. He's talking about the inbreaking into human history in a very definitive way of the lordship and the reign of God in the power of the Spirit through Christ as manifest in the church throughout this present age. So, yes, you know, my, uh, that, that raises a good point. When I was at Dallas Seminary, I had several professors who said that every reference to the kingdom of God in the gospels is always future. Talking yeah. about the future millennial kingdom. I thought, I don't, how in the world can you get that? And I think just out of consistency, they had to say that. Right. But it seems to me the kingdom of God is now here. Right. It has been fulfilled. It just hasn't been consummated. Uh, it has come in the person of Christ, his rule, his reign, his defeat of Satan, bringing mm-hmm. the forgiveness of sins, uniting God's people as one. But it will not be consummated 
until the return of Christ. Right. But yeah, the kingdom is now here. Jesus talks repeatedly about that. Um, and I, I think that's very consistent with what we see in the book of Revelation. Right. And and also the apostles at, in Acts uh, chapter 2 as well speak of uh, the uh, inauguration of Christ and his uh, sure. ascension. Um, well, take, for example, 1 Corinthians 15. I mm-hmm. talk about this in my book at length, where Paul talks about Christ must reign right. until every enemy is placed beneath his feet. The last enemy is death. Right. That reign is ongoing throughout the pre- It was happening in Paul's day, happening throughout the present course. Of, of church history will be consummated at Christ's return. Mm-hmm. And, and I think the troubles that um, our post-millennial friends have is that, um, you know, we, we consider the intermediate state, but uh, also uh, synonymously in a spiritual sense, Christ is very well ruling internally with, uh, with every believer. Right. Uh, sure. But the problem is that the manifestation of uh, that kingdom being seen by the world is where uh, our post-millennial friends have an issue. Um, so, by the I, way, let me say this: if yeah. I can interrupt you, go ahead. I hope the post-millennialists are right. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I mean, seriously, who would who would be opposed to the idea that that the world will be Christianized, so to speak, and that structures of our society and all of government and business and entertainment and education? would be transformed on the base of Christian principles. I mean, right. yes, I, I would love that to happen. Question is, is that what the Bible says will happen? Mm-hmm. I'm skeptical on that point. So yeah, just wanted to say that. There has to be some sort of reconciliation, right? And, um, and, and so what about, uh, Sam, uh, the misconception that our millennials are pacifists uh, or, you know, uh, as you used the term earlier, they're pessimistic. Uh, and we we believe that it's just going to get worse. And so uh, many believe that all millennialists are, you know, we'll just stand in the corner doing nothing. Um, and uh, for example, as 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 post millennials are more um, more involved in activism, um, protest, and all those things, uh, would we consider ourselves as as people who are passive and in the corner doing absolutely nothing? <laughs> no, no, I think that's a misconception. Yeah. The people who are more passive and kind of do nothing are the premillennialists because they are, at least over the course of history, they have taken a very dim view of the prospects of the church in the world. Um, I don't take a dim view. I think, I think there will be an ever increasing global oppression of the church mm-hmm. by the unbelieving world. But I believe very much in activism. To whatever extent a person's conscience calls for them to engage in the pro-life movement mm-hmm. or in seeking to transform, you know, our educational system. So, so for example, uh, I don't know what it's like where you are, but here in Oklahoma, there's constant daily debate about our public school system. Mm-hmm. What books should the kids be reading? What kind of uh, things should they be taught? And I believe Christians like myself who are all millennials should be very much to the degree that we feel led to do so and bound by our conscience should be very much involved in seeking to bring Christian principles to bear on the education of our children Mm -hmm. or the laws that govern how businesses conduct their operations. So I don't think there's, I don't think there's an inherent passivism in all millennialism at all. Right. If anything, it would be present in premillennialism, certainly not in amillennialism. So again, um, I don't know what the course of history will hold. As far as I can tell, it's entirely possible that Jesus may not return for another thousand years. Mm-hmm. And over the next two, three, four, five hundred years, uh, the church will exert a transforming influence in all areas of society. But I do think that as we approach the second coming, we're going to see what I call a global oppression, a concerted effort on the part of the beast, as described in Revelation, and Satan uh, to uh, oppress the church and to try to crush it. I think times will become increasingly more difficult. Um, But that doesn't mean I'm just going to sit back in my rocking chair and wait Mm -hmm. for the rapture and do nothing. No, Mm -hmm. I, to whatever extent that I can, I want to help make my community, my city, my state, my country better. Right. Uh, after all, I have children and grandchildren that I have to think about, not just mm-hmm. myself. 
and it, it seems beyond just the eschatology eschatological debate it's more of a christian issue right like a people who stand in the truth and so sure. that that is our post to, to stand for truth in all areas of life um you mentioned the beast um and uh this is a, another subject that uh, is quite interesting and so the subject of the antichrist um whether it be a uh, corporate spirit or system of the antichrist or what paul is speaking to the Th- to the thessalonians regarding the man of lawlessness uh what is your understanding or could you shed some light to us who are suffering here and uh you know oh my i don't think i have much understanding on this one <laughs> um first of all the word antichrist nowhere appears in the book of revelation Mm-hmm. The only place it appears are in the Johannine epistles, 1st, 2nd, 3rd John. Uh, I think it appears two or three times. Um, and, you know, in that passage, John says, you have heard that Antichrist is coming, but I tell you, Antichrist is already here. Mm-hmm. Anybody who denies that Jesus is God come in the flesh is Antichrist. Um, now, the beast of Revelation, and I go into this, as you, as you know, if you've read my book, Kingdom Come, I go into this in some detail. Yeah. I think the beast of revelation, which obviously is, it's figurative. I mean, nobody, nobody believes that there was a literal beast rising out of the sea that literally has 10 horns and seven heads. Um, it's like a leopard and its feet like a bear. Nobody believes that's literal. <laughs> what is it? Well, I think it's a composite figure taken from the book of Daniel of the nations of the earth in their opposition to the kingdom of Christ. Mm -hmm. So I think the beast in Revelation is primarily a reference to what I would call the anti-kingdom forces of Jesus. It's this collective embodiment, maybe philosophical, theological, cultural, educational, political, whatever. All of the, um, the opposition to the purposes of Jesus Christ in the church that we see in the world today that's a manifestation of the existence of the beast Mm -hmm. who is animated and empowered by satan now the question then becomes will there be a final embodiment or expression of the beast Mm -hmm. in a singular person right that we call the man of sin or the antichrist that that's the issue um i don't know how to say this without riding the fence (laughs) I, i think the only place where i think there is good evidence to support the view that this could eventually manifest itself in a singular individual is second thessalonians 2. right as paul does talk about the man of sin or the man of lawlessness um i honestly don't know what second thessalonians 2 is talking about (laughs) i have a chapter on it in my book and i kind of and i try to dig deeply into it at the end i say i'm with augustine and said, frankly, I have no idea what Paul's talking about. Here. <laughs> you know, I just, I'm happy uh... to confess my ignorance. Um, <laughs> but could it be? And again, probably 95, 98 percent of all evangelicals believe that there will be a man, a particular individual that we call Antichrist, who will emerge at the end of history. Um, I'm not denying that. I want to make sure I'm not saying that's not true. I'm saying I'm not altogether certain, um, it, but I, I I don't think that's what Revelation is talking about. The beast of Revelation is not the singular Antichrist individual. Right. It's it's all of the collective embodiment of everything that that is against Jesus. It seeks to oppose His kingdom. It seeks to oppress the church. Um, so that I'm pretty certain about. Whether Second Thessalonians two is talking about um, a singular individual who will emerge maybe even within our lifetime. You know, people are saying all the time. I mean, I've heard people say that Emmanuel Macron in France is the Antichrist. Uh, for a long time, Henry Kissinger is the Antichrist. Every president that's ever come along in the United <laughs> Joe States Biden. is the Antichrist. <laughs> Putin is the Antichrist. Well, <clears throat> I think they've all been proven wrong so mm. far. Um, all I know for sure is I'm not the Antichrist. <laughs> um, <laughs> So <laughs> that's kind of, I know that probably doesn't satisfy people because it seems like I'm waffling uh, in uncertainty and I am waffling in uncertainty. Mm-hmm. So I'm sorry, can't help you with that. You know, Sam, for, for the sake of a transpar- uh, transparency, um, well, what could we say would be one of the 
I wouldn't say weakest, but one of the most challenging um, texts in the Bible that somewhat causes us to think, is our millennialism really right? Like, what are some of those difficult views where it gets you to question, you know, is my view actually really right on this subject? I think there are two, and I've already alluded to one of them. Mm -hmm. One of them are the multitude of Old Testament passages that talk about uh, the fulfillment of the covenant made with Abraham, where God will reign with his people on the earth. Mm -hmm. And yet I believe that will come to pass. I just believe it's on the new earth. But a lot of people think, well, it just seems to be talking about something that has to transpire within history. Well, I don't think it does. I think it's something that transpires subsequent to history on the new, in the new heavens and the new earth. Um, the only other text that I find my premillennial friends uh, holding on to is Revelation 20. Um, and many of them try to say this has to be interpreted literally. Well, again, you've got real problems when you do that. So did the angel coming down from heaven hold a literal key? and a yeah. literal bottomless pit, and a literal great chain, and that Satan is a literal dragon, he's a literal serpent, um, and he throws him into the pit, and he literally locks it. Um, this is all symbolic language. Now, it's again, it's symbolic of truth, but we have to determine what do these terms symbolize? What, mm -hmm. To what do they point? Um, and, of course, the whole idea of the first resurrection yeah. and... Um, the second resurrection and those things, uh, the binding of Satan. Some people say um, that, you know, I'll just mention this. That's one of the strongest arguments or the most commonly heard arguments against all millennialism is they say, how can you believe that Satan is bound during this present age? Right. Um, and I say, well, let's be real careful in reading what the text says about this binding. Yeah. When you read down in verse 7, when the thousand years are ended, Satan will be released from his prison, and he will come out to deceive the nations that are at the four corners of the earth to gather them for the battle. Mm -hmm. So Satan is bound with regard to that specific activity. Right. Nothing in the text says that he's bound in the sense that he can't tempt Christians. Mm -hmm. Peter says he's prowling about like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. Uh, we know that Satan is very active in this present age, but there's one thing that he simply cannot do because he's bound or restricted or hindered from it. He cannot orchestrate Armageddon in advance of God's time. Mm -hmm. He cannot orchestrate this global um, collective configuration of nations to oppose the church until such time as God releases him from that restriction which I think will occur at the end of this present age. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Yeah. Now, uh, Sam, with th that being said regarding the Antichrist, um, um, in regards to uh, what you had mentioned there, the binding of Satan, uh, how could you encourage the church in a time like this where, um, you know, men may fear the spirit of the Antichrist or the system of the Antichrist, um, and even become overly focused on looking for the signs of the Antichrist. Um, what should the church focus on um, in this in this uh, time that we are in hopes that the Lord Jesus Christ will return? Jesus. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. That's a simple answer mm -hmm. to a complex question. No, seriously. The centrality and the supremacy of Christ. Mm -hmm. uh, read Colossians 1, 15 to 19. Um, you know, read Ephesians 1, 15 to the end of the chapter. Uh, all of these statements, these beautiful declarations that we have in, in the New Testament about the sovereignty and the supremacy and the centrality of Jesus. Um, I, I do realize that a lot of Christians live in fear mm. and they're obsessed with who is the Antichrist and is there going to be a tribulation and when will it start and will I be here? And I think, listen, You've been redeemed and justified. You're an adopted child of God. You're destined Amen. for an eternity of glory in his presence. That's what you focus on. It's the hope that we already have been assured of in the New Testament of what Jesus has accomplished for us and what he will do. Mm -hmm. um, so, again, uh, I it, it grieves me when I see Christians obsessing over uh, and trying to prophesy the, you know, who is the Antichrist and when's this going to happen and mm -hmm. how close is the rapture? 
Um, if the Bible doesn't give us definitive answers on this, we shouldn't be looking for asking the question. Exactly. I think we just have to be remain tethered to Scripture, uh, rooted and grounded in the Word of God, confident that God is going to uh, consummate all things in Christ, as Ephesians 1 tells us, and keep our eyes riveted on that, knowing that the power of the Holy Spirit, you know, 1 John 4, greater is he who's in us than he who's in the world. Mm-hmm. You know, it's interesting. Con- seemingly conflicting text in 1 John. Chapter 5 says, we are of God, and the whole world lies in the power of the evil one. Mm -hmm. Wow, that's a massively comprehensive and startling declaration. Exactly. And yet we're told in chapter 4, greater is he who is in us than he who is in the world. Mm -hmm. So the Spirit of God, the Spirit of Christ who lives in us, is more powerful, more supreme, than Satan or any dominion that he exerts over the systems of this present world in which we live. So we don't want to get, we don't want to become overly obsessed with Satan and his power in the present day, but we don't want to ignore it. We want to live confidently in the authority we have in Christ. Amen. Amen to that. Now, uh, as we wrap things up, Sam, thank you for explaining to us um, um, on millennialism. So for the sake of our viewers to to, uh, take note, uh, concerning about who you are and uh, many more things that we'd like to know about you, we want to uh, enter into our random questions Ooh. round. Uh, and then uh, one of the first questions we'd like to ask you is, uh, what are your favorite books to read? I mean, outside the Bible, obviously. Outside the Bible. <laughs> <laughs> Good answer. Well, um, anything by or about Jonathan Edwards, mm-hmm. uh, the great Puritan pastor of the 18th century. In fact, I'm right now, digging deeply into this new book called the Oxford Handbook of Jonathan Edwards. Wow. Nice. This thing is massive. It's uh, uh, almost 600 pages. Mm. Uh, so I'm reading that. Um, I'm reading, uh, I'm just starting to read a book, new book by my very dear longtime friend, Greg Beal, called Union with the Resurrected Christ. Mm. Just came out from Baker. Um, I read anything and everything that my friend John Piper writes. Uh, he and I are both um, passionate Christian hedonists which I know sounds like a contradiction in terms, but it's not. <laughs> um, so I, I I love reading commentaries. Um, um, you know, I've been reading books on worship lately in, in conjunction with this book that I've just completed on it. Um, so kind of just pretty much anything that, uh, that kind of weighs heavily on my heart. I'll always read good books on eschatology, um, but... Those are some of the more the, the favorite things that I really enjoy reading. Very good. And uh, who are the theologians that most influenced or shaped your thinking? Yeah. Well, Augustine, John Calvin, Martin Luther, John Owen, right? Puritan theologian of the 17th century. Um, Jonathan Edwards, probably preeminently among all of them. More recently in our day, J.I. Packer. Uh, it was a dear friend who passed away just a couple of years ago. Um, certainly my friend, John Piper, um, I think he's probably the most influential evangelical theologian alive today. Um, I love the writings of D.A. Carson, uh, mm. his commentaries and other books that he writes. Um, so those are the ones who probably influenced me the most. Fantastic. And uh, if you were given a chance uh, to work with any theologian of the past or present, <laughs> on a commentary or any project, who would that be? Gosh. <laughs> oh, my. Probably any of the ones that I just mentioned. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I probably would have to go back to Edwards. Uh, he's just such a fascinating figure. Uh, it's amazing to think that um, he only lived 54 years, never had a computer, didn't have the Internet, didn't have a typewriter. Uh, didn't have access to a whole lot of books. And yet here we are over 300 years later, uh, still, uh, you know, I'm looking that you all can't see it, but directly across, uh, up against that wall, I have one, two, three, four, five, six shelves of nothing but works by and about Jonathan Edwards. Wow. Wow. Something about the man and his perspective on God, um, that, and the way he lived his life that continues to exert an influence on the body of Christ. Now, again, I don't, I don't agree with everything Edwards believed. Edwards was something of a post-millennialist, by the way. Yeah. Um, but, um, 
his his understanding of the greatness of God uh, is just, I mean, the to think that 300 and some odd years later, it's still transforming people in our day. Most of us, if not virtually all of us, will die. And after a couple of weeks, people will go on with life and forget about us. Um, that didn't happen with Edwards. It's amazing. Mm. Uh, others like him. Um, so, yeah, I'll probably be Jonathan Edwards. Very good. And uh, for someone who is looking for a church, what biblical advice would you give them or recommend to them? Read very closely their statement of faith and be very suspicious of a church if it doesn't have one. Mm. Uh, I've, I, I look at church websites all the time, and I'm just surprised when they say all these things about themselves, what they do, but they don't tell us where they stand on biblical truth. So read closely statements of faith. Look for a church that I think is both what I call word and spirit, a convergence of the two, committed to the functional authority of the Bible, a church that preaches through um, the books of the Bible verse by verse, a church that is open to the fullness of the Spirit's work in the present day, and that doesn't try to eliminate one uh, to the exclusion of the other. Um, Look at a church that is, um, don't look at size, don't look at numbers, uh, don't even necessarily think about denominational affiliation, but look at how they treat the scriptures. Are they, are they tethered to the word of God? Do they justify their practices based on what they see in the Bible or is it just personal preference? Um, so those are some of the factors that I would say uh, people should consider as they're looking for a church. Amen to that. And, and lastly, Sam, for someone who is not saved, what is the gospel? Oh, I love answering that question. The gospel is the gloriously great good news of what God has done through the sinless life, substitutionary death, and bodily resurrection of Jesus to satisfy his wrath against us and to secure for us the forgiveness of sins now and forevermore by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. That's the gospel. Praise God. Amen. Well, there you have it. Thank you so much, uh, Sam. And, uh, you know, we are so blessed and privileged to have an instrument of God uh, be here today with us to expound the word, to teach us the doctrines of the Bible. And uh, for those who may be wanting to inquire more about uh, Sam, check out his website, check out his resources, look at the links below. And uh, we hope that through this program, you have been enlightened to not only know about the eschatological doctrines of the Bible within the Christian church, but most importantly, if you do not know Jesus Christ, it is time to repent, be reconciled to God, trust in him, believe the gospel, and receive eternal life. I am Brother Joshua Olivares with my brother, Brother Jonathan Olivares. We thank you for joining us on Let's Ask a Theologian. May the Lord keep you, may the Lord bless you, and always remember that Jesus Christ is God. Amen.